All right. Uh, so in the previous lecture, we've started to delve into this topic of eigenvalues and eigenvectors without really defining what these are all about. But we've at least given you a motivating example in the form of dynamical systems, particularly of second order differential equations. And we showed you that if you are indeed able to evaluate whenever these eigenvalues and eigenvectors exist, if you're able to evaluate them, so we assume them, right, that there are these numbers lambda 1 and lambda 2 in the field F, right, and there are these vectors V1 and V2, which under the action of a certain matrix doesn't get any rotation, but is only scaled up or down, right, then we'll be able to very conveniently solve for this second order differential equation. And we showed you the way we depict such solutions in the form of phase portraits, right. So we showed you one kind of uh, representation of this solution where we said that if this is x1 and this is x2 which are uh, in control theory we like to call them the state variables. So then we saw that if you have this as your v2 and this as your v1 right then starting from different locations different initial conditions such as this if V1 corresponds to the slower eigenvalue, by slower I mean, suppose lambda 1, lambda, uh, yeah, lambda 2, if this is the case, right, just to, re this is a refresher of what we've done the previous day, right. So then V1 corresponds to the eigenvector for lambda 1, V2 corresponds to the eigenvector for lambda 2. Right, and we showed you that this is a distorted version of the nice, the nicer picture that we had when we had them diagonalized, right? So something like this. So you start from somewhere over here, for instance, you would end up like this. Start from somewhere over here, you would possibly end up something like this, so on and so forth. You start up here, uh, okay, so it would be something like this and so on, right? Now it turns out that the picture isn't very different if the signs of these fellows were flipped in the sense that if you had on the other hand zero, let's see, lambda one lambda 2. So you see what happens then. Which is the faster eigenvalue now? Again, the one that is larger in magnitude because it's the exponentiation that matters, right? So this blows up at the rate e to the lambda 2t and lambda 1 and lambda 2 both being positive. What do you expect? So as you go towards infinity, which is what will happen if these are your eigenvalues, or these are the numbers associated with the solution, right? You will get e to the lambda 1 t, e to the lambda 2 t, which is the one that predominates, the faster one, of course, right? So as you go to infinity, you will tend to do so along the faster eigenvector, obviously, right? So all that you need to do in this case is reverse the arrowheads. Right? And that would give you the phase portrait for this. A little more interesting case is the following. When you have lambda 1 is less than 0, is less than lambda 2. Right? Now things get interesting. Because now, along one direction, it turns out that there is a tendency to draw towards the origin. Along the other direction, there is a tendency to draw away from the origin. If I look at a diagonal matrix like so, where this is lambda 1 and this is lambda 2 and this is 0 and this is 0, then of course V1 is given by 1, 0 and V2 is given by 0, 1, right? Let me just call it E1 and E2 because V1 and V2 we have reserved for the original eigenvectors. This is of course after the transformation. Any 2 by 2 matrix 
we have assumed that there exists numbers lambda 1, lambda 2 and corresponding vectors v1, v2 such that it can be transformed to this form. Once you have transformed it to this form, then these turn out to be the eigenvectors or the so-called vectors in this form. Yeah, so which allows us to conveniently then draw it like this where maybe what had we called it x1 tilde maybe in the previous lecture x2 tilde. So then this is 1 comma 0 and this is 0 comma 1. So these happen to be the principal directions then, the irrotational directions. So what happens in this case, you see, along x1 tilde, if you start from a point on this axis, you will tend to move towards this, whereas along this direction, you will tend to move away from this, is it not? However, what happens if you start from a point such as this, not on the principal axis? Can you guess what will happen? Of course, there is some attraction towards the origin along this direction, but there is an equivalent repulsion along this direction, right? So what is the resultant? I mean, as I said, treat this like the velocity, right? That's what your x dot is, right? So then what happens? This is your resultant. Along one direction, it is lambda 1 times x1. Along the other direction, it is lambda 2 times x2, right? So what is it? It's going to lead to a direction, velocity direction such as, such as this. So at every point, if you know the velocity direction, which is what we call the field, the vector field, nothing to do with the field and the vectors we have learned in this course so far. It's a vector field. So what, what happens? You can just sketch it like this, right? Yeah. See, if you're very close to this point, on the other hand, then what happens? The magnitude of x2 tilde is very small. So even though there is a tendency to go like this, it's very small, whereas the component along this direction is high. So you can expect a resultant like so. So if I now extrapolate this idea, and if you permit me to erase this, can I not say that the solution will be somewhat like this? Right? So along one direction, there is a tendency to go towards the origin, but eventually you never land up on the origin unless you start exactly on this axis. No matter howsoever close you start from this axis, if you're not exactly bang on top of this axis, you'll eventually get carried away towards infinity. So this is what we call a saddle, a saddle point for this dynamical system. This was a stable node. If you reverse the arrowhead, it becomes an unstable node. This is, on the other hand, a saddle point. Of course, why is it called a saddle? It's, you know, just maybe an artist's imagination. So a saddle, the English word is basically something to do with a, something you put on a horse back. So if you remember what you put on a horse back, the saddle, the shape of the saddle is somewhat like this, right? Excuse my drawing, but, right? Right? So, of course, I am taking artistic liberties here, uh, but okay. So, the dotted line would mean this is, yeah? This is a saddle. And if you think about it, if you let a ball loose on this, this is the direction of the horse. So, this is the direction of the head of the horse, this is the tail of the horse. If you let a ball loose along this, it will roll by just fine, except for the fact that if you are slightly off the midline, right? you would roll off. So there's exactly one line, a thin line along which if you tread, you will exactly land up at this point, which is the minima or the equilibrium. On the other hand, if you're slightly off center, if you, if you take a top view of the horse's back, and if you're slightly off center, you would get carried away either on this direction or in this direction. So this is what happens on a saddle, on a horse's back, right? So that's exactly what's happening here. If I now draw this in the original uh, coordinate system, it would, of course, look like a distorted version of this because this is where the vectors are really nice and orthogonal. But in the original matrix, the eigenvectors or these vectors v1 and v2 need not be orthogonal. So let's say this is v1 and suppose this is v2. So of course, v1 corresponds to the direction corresponding to lambda 1, which is stable. So you will see that it would be something like, like this. All 
All right? Yeah. So this is again. So along one direction it gets stretched because now you don't have orthogonal vectors v1 and v2 unlike e1 and e2 which were orthogonal in that nice form, right? But you see the picture still remains very much the same in nature, right? Yeah. So this is how the typical solution along a saddle point would look. So at least for planar dynamical systems, you will agree that if we understand this idea of what kind of numbers lambda 1 and lambda 2 allow us to meet this condition that A acting on some vector leads to just a scaling of that vector is useful in solving such differential equations. When we say solutions, again to reiterate, by solutions we don't mean just close form solutions. This is as good as a solution as any, right? When you say solving a differential equation, this is a solution of a differential equation, okay? You pick your initial condition and from there, due to the uni uniqueness of the solution, you can just go ahead and draw the trajectory, <laughs> right? This is on the phase portrait, right? So now, of course, there are several other kinds of possibilities. We will not get into that because those will involve when these lambdas are not real, you give me a real matrix, but the lambdas need not be real, okay? Those situations do arise. Just as an instance, you take this, I mean, although I'm going to do it a little more formally, but you already probably know how to solve for eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So I'll just give you this example to work on while right? Take this as your A matrix and think of ways of solving for eigenvalues and see if you get real values for those eigenvalues, okay? If you can get real eigenvalues. The point is, so far we have assumed that we'll be able to get eigenvalues. But what if it's not the case or at least even if it's not the case, can we at least come up with some condition when we'll surely be able to obtain Right? It's on our wish list that no matter what A matrix is given to me, if I'm to solve for X dot is equal to AX, it is on my wish list that no matter what A is given to me, I'll always be able to find this V1 and V2 and Lambda 1 and Lambda 2 such that A acting on V1 gives Lambda 1 V1, A acting on V2 gives Lambda 2 V2. Why is it on my wish list? Because I've seen precisely the reason for this. I'll be able to easily sketch this and be able to talk about the solution of that differential equation. But we can't leave things like this to chance and to our wish list, right? We have to explore whether indeed there is any point behind having such a wish. We can wish for a lot of things. Doesn't mean it turns true, right? So under what circumstances will we always be able to do this? Yeah. So let's see. What we are essentially asking for is on the abstract vector space, finite dimensional. Now that's very important, okay? We are not going to talk about infinite dimensional because in infinite dimensional vector spaces, if you're talking about mappings or linear operators, okay? On infinite dimensional vector spaces, it turns out there do exist such operators which may have no eigenvalues whatsoever. So whenever we are talking about the existence of the eigenvalues, all right, we will confine ourselves to finite dimensional vector spaces. Okay, so you have an operator, a linear operator acting on V to lead to another object in V, clear? Now, the way we have defined this object or the way we have carried out our listing our wish list and all, what we would desire is this, right? So if we have lambda belonging to the field, all right? What's the field? The field is the one over which this vector space is described. Hmm? Such that there exists V in V satisfying phi acting on V leads to nothing but lambda scalar multiplication with V, all right? Then 
lambda comma v is said to be an eigen value eigen vector pair for phi eigen is a german word which means it remains the same okay doesn't change okay so it's an eigen value eigen vector pair the lambda is the eigen value the v is the eigen vector of course you all, all already probably know about this from your earlier uh, dabbings, dabblings into matrix theory and other things but now we're going to define this over operators but really is there much of a difference after all we are talking about finite dimensional vector spaces and we're talking about linear operators on them just assign an ordered basis and all you'll be talking about are matrices throughout so as per this description or definition if you would what we are asking for is the following that we have phi acting on v is equal to lambda times v all right now let's say we assign some ordered basis so b is an ordered basis for v okay so we suppose of course this will exist because it's a finite dimensional vector space hmm? so therefore this is one and the same as writing phi v's representation under this basis is equal to lambda times v's representation under this basis but what is this going to be equal to is this not the same as the representation of phi under this basis acting on the representation of v under this basis which is the same as lambda times and you're back to the domain of Euclidean spaces or things similar to that. If f is r, it is exactly a Euclidean space for some r to the n. Yeah, if it's not, if it's, let's say, c, something else, then at least it go, it's going to look like a matrix. Yeah, no doubts about this. Now, let's say you're talking about r or c. For our purposes, we'll be focusing on r or c. Why c? That will be clear. Actually, I've dropped a hint about why c just go through that example I've just talked about okay we'll revisit it but nonetheless for the time being what does this mean does this not imply that phi b minus lambda times the identity matrix yeah this whole thing acting on the coordinate representation of B leads to 0. Let's just give it a name and call it A and be done with this box notation and yeah. So let's just say this is A minus lambda I acting on what is this equivalent to? In other words, what are we actually trying to solve? If we want to find out, yeah, sure. We want to solve for a kernel, but kernel of what exactly? It's an egg and chicken problem, is it not? Apparently there's one equation and we want to find in one shot for both lambda and v. So we have to split it up in such a way that it makes sense. If you're trying to find out the kernel, my question to you would be, how do you know what lambda to search for? There's so many possibilities for lambda, right? You're right, it's, a, it's something in the kernel. Yeah, of course. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. That's a non-trivial. So that's why it's a non-trivial kernel. So you want a minus lambda i to lose rank. Yes, you want a minus lambda i to lose rank. Yeah. So you want something to be in the kernel. V is equal to 0 is obviously going to be the, in the kernel of everything, whether it's invertible or whether it's, uh, you know, non-invertible, irrespective of that. But the point is, what are we going to solve for? How do we tackle this problem? We have V and lambda, both of these to deal with. So we will deal with something now that hitherto we haven't delved into much deeper. We will not talk about, we haven't, and in the future also we will not 
dig too deep into it. But for this one particular topic, we will talk about things like determinants. And you will have to indulge me a bit here. See what this means is that there is some linear combination of the columns of this object that vanishes. Some non-trivial linear combination as your friend has pointed out. Yeah. So yeah, maybe I should point it out here itself that this is not equal to 0. Then we are done with it once and for all instead of imposing it there. Right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> if this object is indeed singular or has dependent columns, do you remember determinant, I am not going into again, not going into the depths of determinants, but if the columns are linearly independent, uh, I mean linearly dependent on one another, can you not zero out a particular column entirely? When you take determinant operations, right, you subtract some scaled version of a column from another column. And by doing this operation sequentially, can you not zero out an entire column? Because that's what the linear combination equaling zero means, right? So that means the determinant of this object has to be zero. And that is independent of V. See, if you are trying to find out V, you need to know what lambda is. But what I am saying is if you want to find out lambda, you don't have to bother with V. V. There's this other tool that I've just plucked out of thin air almost, which is the determinants. Right? Because the determinant allows me to evaluate lambda without worrying about what is that V. But if I started with trying to find out what is V, I would be faced with the proposition of first telling you what the lambda is. So this gives us a way out of the chicken and egg problem, right? So what we will say is that let's try to figure out what is the determinant of a minus lambda i equal to 0. Solve for, okay? But now, here's the interesting deal. What is the guarantee that such a solution will exist? For instance, now we will look at this matrix. So look at this matrix. What do you think this matrix is, uh, entries, the entries of this matrix, where do they come from? No, no. I mean, wh what field do they come from? Real? Are you sure you want to stick around with real? Yeah? Complex. So complex is of course an extension of the real field. So you want to stick around with complex? Why? Here's why. Because if you now want to find out this, let's try to see this. So this is our A. So A minus lambda i is equal to minus lambda minus 1, 1 minus lambda, the determinant thereof. Yeah? So what is this? Lambda squared plus 1. Now if you want lambda squared plus 1 is equal to 0, you are led to the situation where lambda is plus or minus i. Now if you had stuck with this as a real matrix, matrix whose entries are real, then you will have the situation where no eigenvalues would exist. Yeah? If you consider this to be a real matrix, then it has no eigenvalues over the real field. But if you go over the complex field, which is of course an extension of the real field, then of course you have eigenvalues. And that is fundamentally the property of the complex field. It is so called algebraically closed. What is at the heart of this? What do you mean by algebraically closed? You take any polynomial whose coefficients come from that particular field and the roots of that polynomial must also belong to that field. That's the definition of an algebraically closed field. So where does polynomial come into this picture? Of course, if you look at the determinant of this, this is always going to be a polynomial. So that is the key observation. This, this object over here is a, in fact, it's more than just any polynomial. It's a monic polynomial is what we will call it. So what's a monic polynomial where the coefficient of the highest degree term is unity, all right? If it's not unity, if it's allowed to be any number, then you can also make it zero and then the degree drops, 
right? So because it's monic, it's guaranteed to be of degree n. When the dimension of the vector space is n, this polynomial, yeah. So yeah, let's impose this condition now that dimension of v is equal to n. Then this is a monic polynomial of degree n, right? And now if you're taking a monic polynomial of degree n, and if you're taking the matrix, no matter whether its entries look like real numbers or not, you just assume that the field you're working with is the field of complex numbers. And then because of the algebraically closed property of the complex numbers, you'll always end up having n eigenvalues. All right. So this is the guarantee that over finite dimensional vector spaces, every linear operator yeah, over the complex field, over an algebraically closed field in fact, not just the complex field, any algebraically closed field, any field if I tell you it's an algebraically closed field, it's guaranteed to have these eigenvalues. Okay, so existence of eigenvalues is at least established, right? But that is not enough. What we did was something more. We did this diagonalization of the matrix through some transformation. And that diagonalization was only made possible not just by these eigenvalues, but a very crucial role was played by the eigenvectors. Because when we stacked up these eigenvectors side by side, they in fact gave us this particular transformation. So we need some special properties of those eigenvectors as well. The existence of mere eigenvalues will not guarantee that we will be able to come up with such a transformation, okay? Let's just take our next example to motivate this. Now that we know that eigenvalues would exist, let's take this example, 2, 1, 0, 2. Right? Again, let's say this is over complex numbers. Whether you take real or complex in this case won't matter. So what do we do? We take the determinant of 2 minus lambda 1, 0, 2 minus lambda. Right? So this is going to be just 2 minus lambda, the whole squared is equal to 0, which means lambda is equal to 2 comma 2. Right? So now let's test our understanding through this example. We'll also show you how to get those eigenvectors if possible. Okay? So what we have here is a situation of repeated roots of that monic polynomial. By the way, that monic polynomial, which we've just described to you, has a name. It's called the characteristic polynomial. Okay? Chi of a matrix A x is equal to determinant x i minus a. When you equate it to 0, whether you take a minus x i, x i minus a, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, it's just a sign, right? So this, the solutions of the characteristic polynomial are exactly the eigenvalues. Whenever such solutions exist over the field in question, you're guaranteed to get your eigenvalues. So if you choose a complex field, even if the matrix looks like a real matrix, you'll always get your requisite number of eigenvalues, which is equal to the dimension of the vector space. Right? So existence of eigenvalues is done and dusted. But now, let's focus our attention back on this. What are we saying? Now we know the lambdas. So all that we need to do now is evaluate the v's, the eigenvectors. Okay? Let's call them v1 and v2. So we want v is equal to v1. So one v1 will come from 2, the other v2 will also come from 2. Let's see if we can find two different v1 and v2 for this which would serve our purpose, right? So, what we have is 2, 1, 0, 2 times, so let's call this V1 as V11 and V12 is equal to the eigenvalue times 2, V11, V12, right? Now, what happens? This is 2, v11 plus v12 is equal to 
v11, the second one is 2 v12 is equal to 2 v12. What does that tell us? Yeah? <coughs> Yeah, sure, rank is reduced, but how do we solve it? Anyway, we could have pulled it on this side as well. Just some tomfoolery probably I'm doing. You could have just said 0, 1, 0, 0. Yeah, that's in fact what the row reduced echelon form. So what is the solution to this? Yeah, of course, but what is the solution? So what is V1 going to be equal to? Look. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, no, so what is, what is this going to look like? What are the two tuples here? Yeah? For first one is, so V11 can be any arbitrary value, right? Yeah, V11 can be any arbitrary value, but V12, this is not really adding anything really, is it? And V12 has to be 0, because from this one itself, you see V12 is 0. Yeah, so this must be 0, and this you just call some V11. But hang on. We had two eigenvalues, is it not? So we should have expected two different solutions. Do you think that when you write it in terms of V21 and V22, this will look any different? No, right? It's still going to look like the same. So we're going to end up with the same solution. So how many eigenvectors are we getting then? We have two eigenvalues at lambda is equal to 2. But we only end up getting one eigenvector. Yeah? Will that allow us to diagonalize this? The way we have highlighted or the way we have outlined the diagonalization process in the previous lecture, it seems like we are stuck, right? This is precisely the problem. So, however, there is one crucial issue I must point out. When even if you have repeated eigenvalues here, like this, isn't the existence of at least one eigenvector guaranteed? Let's say you had a 30 cross 30 matrix here, in which let's say there are one, there's one eigenvalue which has 15 repetitions. You may not end up having 15 eigenvectors for those 15 repetitions of the same eigenvalue, but will you not at least have one eigenvector corresponding to one eigenvalue? Why? What is the argument? Well, it's very fundamental. You see, you have to have a minus lambda i have a non-trivial kernel. For the existence of the eigenvalue itself, a minus lambda i, the determinant must vanish. If the determinant of a minus lambda i vanishes, it means a minus lambda i is singular. If a minus lambda i is singular, it means its columns cannot be linearly independent and therefore there must be something non-trivial in the kernel, right? So at least for every distinct eigenvalue, you must have at least one eigenvector, maybe not as many of the copies or as many distinct eigenvectors as the number of repetitions of the eigenvalue, but at least for every eigenvector va value, there must be one eigenvector, right? So that part of the existence is done. So for every distinct eigenvalue, let me repeat this erase this part from here, there exists one eigenvector at least. So if you are dealing with an algebraically closed field, you will end up having exactly n eigenvalues, some of which may be repeated, some of which may be distinct, but no matter whether they are repeated or distinct, if you have R distinct eigenvalues. You may not have all n distinct, right? You may have r distinct eigenvalues, in which case you are going to land up with at least r eigenvectors, one for each at least. Yeah? So that much is at least guaranteed. So at least if someone asks you whether, how are you sure? So, so far we only assumed in the previous lecture that we have this condition. But it turns out then that from here, you will have, if they are all distinct eigenvalues, you will in fact have one eigenvector for each of them. The problem now is somewhat different. Are these eigenvectors going to be linearly independent? Right? So that is something which we shall tackle in the next module.